If you have your notes, let's go right into this message today, talking about faithful friends. We're in this book of Philippians, an amazing book. Paul is the author, and he has Timothy writing with him. It's interesting that he had Timothy mentioned because I think what Paul was trying to tell us something, it's good to have a mentor, it's good to be uh, encouraging the next generation. And by saying Paul and Timothy here, we see that he was encouraging the next generation. Let me go ahead and right away and put up the first two verses of Philippians chapter 1, where we read Paul and Timothy. Now, you notice something interesting here. If you're familiar with the other letters of the Apostle Paul, he'd usually write Paul and Apostle, but in this letter, he doesn't say that. He just says Paul and Timothy. The reason for that is Paul is writing to friends. This letter that he writes doesn't have a lot of correction. If you're familiar with the other letters that Paul writes, a lot of times he's kind of straightening out some church issues. There's not a lot of church issues in the church in Philippi. It's a great church, and he's writing to them as friends. So it's just Paul and Timothy, he writes to them. I haven't done this, but apparently if you go through and you count up how many times Paul uses the word I, my, and me, it's a hundred times. And it just indicates how intimate this letter is. 16 times in the book of Philippians, you have the word joy or a variation thereof. So it's, it's a happy letter. It's a joyful letter, I should say, being a difference between joy and happiness, if we want to make that distinction. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, they've made a choice to serve Jesus. A bond servant is somebody, I make a choice to serve Jesus. Notice it says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. It doesn't say to all the sinners that are in Philippi. You know, sometimes we hear this phrase, and I understand it. There's, it's certainly true. I am a sinner saved by grace. David Coop is a sinner saved by grace. But I'm so glad that God sees me as righteous in right standing. He didn't say to the sinners that are there. He said, no, to you saints. God sees you as a complete work. And we'll talk about that when we get to verse 6. Because it says there in verse 6 that, he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete that work. Every carpenter who goes out to build a house, what does he see? He sees the completed house. If you're baking a cake, don't you see the completed cake when you're going out to bake it? You know, God sees the completed you when he goes to work in your life. Philippians chapter 1 is one of my favorite chapters, but it's also one of my most embarrassing chapters in my career as a pastor. And I, I might have told you this story before, but Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, you know, and God is able to do exceeding, no, the God who started good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that a good verse? Isn't that an encouraging verse? You know, God started this work in you, God's going to complete that work in you. We had a lady come to our church, and she was going through a difficult time, and, and uh, so I was going to send her a little email of encouragement. I, I'd only met her one time, and she emailed, so I would respond. As a pastor, write a nice response, you know, God's going to complete the work in you. So I wrote that little encouraging email, and then at the bottom, I just put Philippians 1.6, didn't write the verse, knew she'd look it up, Philippians 1.6, and then I said, you know, blessings, Pastor Dave, and hit the send button. Have you ever hit the send button on an email, and you wonder if what you wrote was really what you meant? And I thought, oh dear. Did I put Philippians 1, 6? I think I put Philippians 1, verse 8. And so I thought, well, I better read Philippians 1, verse 8, what that reads. And so I, I looked at my Bible, and here's what Philippians 1, verse 8 says. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with all affection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I had made a, a big blooper, and uh, I never did see that lady again. I don't know what happened to her, but anyhow, <laughs> we pray that she's doing good, and God is completing the work that he began in her life. Paul's in prison. He writes this letter from prison. It's been 12 years since he started the church. Started in church in Philippi. He was sent there by the Holy Spirit. You can read the account in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, the Lord says, don't go towards Asia. Asia was the Silk Road. He had two choices. He could go towards the Roman Road. He could go towards the Silk Road. He doesn't go east. We don't know why, but he, he goes towards Rome. And really, the gospel has circled all the way around and now comes back to Jerusalem. If you follow what the route the gospel has taken from Europe, across the ocean, now coming back into Asia, there's a movement in China called Back to Jerusalem, 
how it circled the globe. You can just see kind of the migration. It's an interesting study. He doesn't take the Silk Road. The Holy Spirit forbids him to go there. He goes the other direction, and he ends up in this town called Philippi. Meets a native name, a woman named Lydia. Lydia's into high fashion. She would have been the Prada of the day, you know, and she sells uh, high fashion from Turkey. She's from Turkey. She sells purple linen, which was, uh, which was, you know, what you would find on Rodeo Drive back in the time. It was the finest of fashion, and she has a prayer meeting in her house, and that's where the church gets started. They get thrown in jail, and you know the story of the Philippian jailer. So that's the early days of this church. Twelve years later, guess who's in prison? Paul's in prison, and he writes this letter to them from prison. This church has been extremely supportive all those years. They've supported Paul, and so this relationship reflects that. They are very faithful to him. So a couple points. Number one, you know, faithful friends are committed. One of the things that kept strength in Paul's life while he was in prison is the joy of having faithful friends. And you know, when you're going through a hard time, one of the things that gives you strength is to have faithful friends stand with you. I, I mean, not the people that say that they're behind you, and then when you go through a hard time, they're really behind you, like 20 miles behind you. Like, where are they? They're back there somewhere. No, no. They really are standing with you. They're standing with you when you're in the good times. They're standing with you in the bad times. They are committed. And Paul had been through some tough times, but this church, they just stood with the Apostle Paul. Philippians 1.3, out of the message reads, Every time you cross my mind, I break out an exclamation of thanks to God. Every exclamation is a trigger to prayer. Cause him to go to prayer. In the Message Bible, Proverbs 17, 17 reads, Friends love through all kinds of weather, and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. One of the things that brings you joy, and this month we're talking about joy, one of the things that brings you joy is to have faithful, committed friends. The opposite is an unfaithful friend. Proverbs 25, 19, it reads, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth, and a foot out of joint. Everybody's had a bad tooth, right? A toothache. Aren't they a royal pain, a toothache? I mean, it just all day long, it throbs, and you're just like, oh, it affects everything you do. That's what an unfaithful friend is like. You expect them to be there. You expect them to help. Unfaithfulness. Who wants that? Unfaithful marriage, unfaithful business deal. You know, God's not into unfaithfulness. He's really into faithfulness. That's what's important to God. It's interesting if you go to Matthew 25, verse 21 and 23, read exactly the same. It's the parable of the talent. One got five and one got two. The one with five went out, multiplied it, doubled it. The one with two went out, multiplied and doubled it. Now, when the reward time comes, the master comes back, his words to them are exactly the same, well done, good and faithful servant. God's far more interested in faithfulness than he is in success. As a matter of fact, winning, on your next page, winning in God's kingdom looks like faithfulness. I don't know what winning looks like in your world, but you can just breathe a sigh of relief. You say, well, I want to be a winner. If you want to be a winner, be faithful. That's what God expects of us, is to be faithful. Well, I want to be super successful. And if I am to be super successful, I have to drive this, live this, wear this, be this, have this. Then I'm successful. God just says, chill out, relax. Just be faithful. That's it. Well done, good and faithful. The guy who multiplied five, Gets the same reward as the one to multiply two. I think we're going to get to heaven one day. We're going, to, we're going to be shocked at some of the people that have been rewarded because they were just faithful with what they had. God may have dealt you a lot. Be faithful of that. God may have dealt you a little. Be faithful of that. The reward's the same. Enter into, the Bible says, I think I put it in your notes on the previous page, Matthew 25, maybe. Yeah, enter into the joy of your Lord. You see it on the bottom of the first page? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Hey, I'd like to get into joy. How do I get into joy? Be faithful. What brings joy to other people in your life? Be faithful. Be a faithful friend. That'll bring joy. It brings joy in your life when people are faithful. Likewise, if people are unfaithful, it sucks the life out of you, doesn't it? Something about having faithful friends. Here in this book, this letter, we see Paul had faithful friends. So good to have faithful, faithful friends. There was an article that came out in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago now, and it was called, it, the title caught my attention because it says, I love Vancouver, but it doesn't love me. Written by Aaron Hildebrandt, he said, the first thing to really bite us was the re reality of how hard it is to make friends here. It's a problem that plagues everyone. Growing up in Manitoba took a lot of effort to get from place to place, so plans were never tentative. In Vancouver, you have options. It's easy to get from place to place, and always so much going on that social commitments are tenuous. People bail all the time. You can plan a party, have a dozen RSVPs, and have every one of them cancel an hour before the party. That exact scenario happens often that we have a term for it. It's called getting Vancouvered. And yes, I've been party to it. I've canceled on people at the last minute only to find out later that they spent their evening alone on their birthday. It's not one of those memories I try to keep buried. I'm sorry I did that to you, me and a dozen other people. It's hard to make friends when everybody is so noncommittal. But another factor is an oddity we discovered over the years because space is so small and people spend so much time out in the city, no one invites people over. Having friends over to our apartment isn't something that happens casually. It makes it kind of hard to play board games with four to six people in our room. He talks about this. Ask anyone about this stuff, they'll confirm it. Socially, Vancouver sucks, and almost no one has particularly close friends, just a selection of good acquaintances. That kind of went viral. I found it in a lot of different blogs in different places because so many people could resonate with that. So what brings joy in our life is having faithful friends. Paul had a faithful kind of life group in Philippi. You know, we have life groups today that continue to go even though somebody's in another place. Some of our life group, they're in Hong Kong right now, and we talk back and forth. We're still connected. That's why we're really big on life group. A few weeks ago, we had this message on live better by being in community. And I encourage you to be connected with others. There is a joy that comes from having faithful, faithful friends. You can be that. I can be that. We add joy to other people's life. And it's a joy to us to have somebody who sticks closer than a brother. Somebody who's with you through the good times and the bad times. I don't know how Paul did in Philippi, but he developed good friendships and they were with him. When he was having some tough times financially, they sent money. At one time, when he's in jail, they sent a guy named Epaphroditus, you can read about it in chapter 2, they sent Epaphroditus to jail just to check out, hey, Paul, how you doing? And this isn't the Canadian jails, please understand. This is, you know, our jails are kind of like the Hotel Hilton, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, uh, they're Hilton with, you know, compared to what they had back there. Uh, but he, they sent Epaphroditus, check on him. You read in the book to Corinthians, they said the church from Macedonia, that's Philippi, they sent support over. So this was this church who didn't just talk about it, they really were there for them. Have, do you have friends, you know, that you're going through a hard time and all of a sudden they show up at your door, hey, can I help you move? Can I, can I help you do, and they, it just brings you joy. This is what Paul had, and that helps us frame this letter that we have here to the church in Philippi. God does not ask us to be successful. God asks us to be faithful. You could Twitter that. that that's, that's so true. When a world, that's, there's so much pressure to be successful, God just said, just, just be faithful. Be faithful to your friends. First of all, be faithful to God. Be faithful in your marriage. Be faithful at your workplace. Be faithful. A fruit of the Spirit is to, be, is to have faith, to be faithful. You know, and faithful, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter in the Hall of Faith, some of those people didn't look so successful. Vagrants wandering through the wilderness, wearing animal skins, cut in half, killed, flogged. 
you know, they, they weren't the model picture of success in today's world, but according to God, they made the hall of faith because they were faithful. God is interested in people that are faithful. And that's what he's looking for. Well done, good and faithful servant. Secondly, faithful friends partner with you. As I mentioned, they sent support to Paul. They sent Epaphroditus to check up on him. They partnered with him. It wasn't so much, you know, what can I get out of you and out of this friendship? What, what's in it for me? It was, how come I come alongside and help you? That was their approach. And so Paul says to them when he writes, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Twelve years later, even though he's in prison, they're still standing beside him. We all need friends like that, people that partner. We need to be a friend like that, somebody who partners with others. Success in heaven is measured by faithfulness. We said it before, just saying it another way to drive the point home, success in heaven measured by faithfulness. It's so counterculture, we've got to keep repeating it. Because it's so easy to get wrapped up and say, oh, I've got to be successful. Be faithful. It, the success, the things, the stuff, it'll happen. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. God is primarily looking for people that are faithful. And partnering with Paul, they were faithful friends, brought great joy to his life. Thirdly, faithful friends understand that God is not done with you yet. You've heard somebody say, well, God's not done with me yet. We have baptismal candidates today. God's not done with them. God's not done with you. He's not done with any of us. And uh, that's where we get this verse, chapter 1, verse 6. Such a good verse. We should probably read out loud together. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. You guys ready? All right, here we go. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul says, I'm certain of this. He began the good work within you, and his work. It's not Paul's work, God's work. It's, it's not the pastor's work. It's not the life group leader's work. It's not your dad's or your mom's. Or, it's God who does the work where? In you. He's a spirit. God's love. He works in your spirit. He begins the work. And God doesn't walk off the job. There's some friends that walk out of your life. They just say, you know what? You are too complicated. You are, you're just way too stressed. I, I just can't handle your friendship. You, you wear me out or whatever. They just, okay, that's it. I'm out. God's not like that. You can't wear God out. He forgives you. He lifts you back up. And he completes the work. He sees you completed. Like I said earlier, the chef, or the baker sees a completed cake. That's what he sees. The builder sees a finished house. And God sees a finished you. He says, man, you're good. You're beautiful. Wow. Do I ever bake good cakes? Do I ever make good saints? He, he sees a completed you. He's, he's all kind of working from that perspective of, ah, I'm going to complete this work. You are my masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. You're gorgeous. You're fantastic. You're God's doing the construction. How could it be anything but fantastic? This artist was painting his masterpiece. And he, he set out to do this. He got started, and he was painting the backdrop and a little bit of splash of gray there and some yellow there and some green. He was painting this backdrop, and a friend walked in the back, and he was so consumed with the painting, he didn't see his friend walk in. Then he caught him, his attention, and he looked over, oh, there, his friend was watching, and he said, well, what do you think of my masterpiece? He said, well, if you want me to be honest, it's kind of like, I don't know what you're painting there, but it's all just like, like a bunch of blotches, and yeah, I don't think it's much of a painting. He says, well, you cannot see what is going to be here, but I can. And others may not be able to see what God's doing in your life, but trust me, God knows what he's doing. He began a good work, and as long as we say, God, I submit to my life. Watch what God can make with your life. 
Faithful friends understand that God is not done with you yet. That means sometimes you got to cut some people some slack. Know that they're a work in progress just like you are. Paul did that with these friends. He knew God was at work in them, but God would complete the work. You know, we have a thing that we use in freedom session and so forth. Pastor Dan, be familiar with this. You know, we're not there to fix one another. God does the fixing. He does the work. We can encourage, we can pray for you, but God does the fixing. He made us, we're created in His image. Number four, faithful friends pray for each other. That's our role. Let God do the fixing. We'll pray for each other. And Paul said, I pray that, you, that your love will overflow more and more, that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Paul was in prison, miles away. But here's the good news. The devil can never, never stop you from praying for somebody else. You could be in prison. You could be 100 miles away or a million miles away. You can continue to pray for those friends. Paul, all those miles away, keeps praying for those other people. Then lastly, faithful friends are sincere. Philippians 1.10, where we read, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. There's a lot in that one verse. We could spend an hour or more just on that verse. I'm going to pick out one word, and that's that word sincere. It's an anglicized Latin word, this word sincere, which means without wax. Interesting, what does word, why would sincere mean without wax? Translated from a Greek word, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it means to be judged by sunlight. If you go to Simple Strong's Concordance and you look up this word sincere, it means judged by sunlight, tested as genuine. And Paul puts in this word, and the readers of the day, they wouldn't know what he was talking about without wax, tested by sunlight. What they would do when they made porcelain, especially fine porcelain, it would be sold in stores, and if there was, it was very difficult to get the porcelain perfect. So what they would do is they would take wax, and they would put the wax in the little crack of the porcelain. Now, when you went to buy it in a store, you probably couldn't see the crack, but tested by sunlight, when it went out into the sunlight, you could see this dark seam in it. In the sunlight long enough, then the wax would melt. So certain stores, when they sold their pottery, they stamped it sincere without wax. And so he's, oh, this is sincere stuff. So what Paul's saying here is, let your life be excellent. Don't, don't cover up with wax. Don't be deceitful, in other words. Don't trick people. Be integrous. Be whole. Be, live with integrity 24-7. Don't be one thing on the outside, but something else on the inside. See, a faithful friend is a sincere friend. When the sunlight hits them, when the truth hits them, they're the same person. One of the greatest compliments you could have received is from a friend to say to you, you are sincere. It would imply you have pure motives, that your conduct is free from deceit and flattery. You express what's really in your heart. You're true to your word. Your yes is yes and your no is no. James in his book talks about that. You don't betray others. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. We've all been betrayed. With somebody who's been unfaithful, that'll suck the joy out of your life. Whereas faithfulness, again, promotes joy. What you say in front of a person is what you say behind them. You purpose to live with integrity 24-7. So, in summary, just going back to these five points again, faithful friends are committed, number one. Number two, faithful friends partner with you. They're there to help you. Faithful friends understand that God's not done with you yet. Faithful friends pray for each other, and faithful friends are sincere. When we have those kind of friendships in our life, there is a joy that comes. It gives us strength. It's a difference than a happiness. It's a joy that comes from people when we walk with Christ in our everyday life. Paul had that, and it kept him. The memories, the strength of those people kept him going while he was in prison. 
God will complete the work within you. And the reason he does is because we allow God to work in our lives. This past week, I took a cab to the airport, and as I was driving, I had a very talkative cab driver. Sometimes cab drivers, they don't want to talk at all. This guy got out, put my luggage in, and he was, before we got in, he was talking to me, hey, buddy, how you doing? And I, I was surprised, because he's old, had a gray beard, and he was, he, was, he was really chatting it up. He knew my name was Dave, because it came up on the computer, hey, Dave, how you doing? And we, we were best of friends before I even got in the car. <laughs> I got in the car, and we're driving along, and I got asked about his family, and he said, is, well, he asked me, he says, is your mom still alive? I go, yes, she is. is your dad still alive? I said, no, he, he's gone on to be with the Lord. And, and I said, well, what about your family? He said, no, no, my, my parents are gone. And I said, so I, I, I could tell what type of religion he was. I said, so in your religion, what do you believe when people die? He says, well, we've, we've adjusted to our culture. And uh, so now we're a little bit different. We believe that when you die, you're like the tree. You just go back into the ground. I said, okay. Um, I said, well... I believe that when you die, you, you, you go to heaven, you know, because of what Christ has done for us. And I explained in a short version what the, the gospel message. He said, well, I, I believe God is in all of us. And we're just now getting up to the airport. You, you believe God is in all of us. I said, well, if, if somebody came and got into your cab without asking permission, would you feel violated? Would you feel like, what are you doing getting into my cab? I, I, would that be love? God doesn't just come into your life. Because it wouldn't be love if he did. It'd be overriding your right to choose. He doesn't just push his way into your life. He shows himself. He, we see his beauty, his goodness, and his love. We're drawn to it. But ultimately, sir, you have to invite him into your life. As much as you'd invited me into this cab, you have to invite God into your life. Now we're at the door, and he, he hands me the, I have to pay now. And so he, he said, that's a good point. And so perhaps some seed had been sown earlier, add some water to it, and God will do the rest. But I want to close today. Have you invited God into your life? He will not force his way in. At this point, I'm going to ask our campus pastors to come up, and they're going to pray with you, share a couple closing thoughts, and you too can have an opportunity to have the most amazing relationship of all. There is a friend who's faithful than anyone else, and that is Jesus Christ. They're going to introduce you to him. Church family here, let's bow our heads and close in prayer. You could be here today, and you've never yet opened your heart, given your life to Jesus, invited him in. God is love. He's all around us. He has to be received into your life. God is the ultimate gentleman. Our Lord Jesus loves us. He so sincerely thinks about us. Today, he's thought about you. You're not here by accident. Absolutely not. If you'll just take a moment today, pray with me and say, God, I want you in my life. I want love in my life. The joy that comes from knowing you, the strength, the peace, the forgiveness, I'm desperate for it. That's you tonight. Pray with us. A powerful but simple prayer. All the candidates we'll hear from in just a moment, they've prayed the same thing. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Saturday night, I open up my heart, the door to my life, and I say, come on in. I want you in my life. I receive your love, I receive your forgiveness, for I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again that I could have life. Today, by faith, I receive that life. Amen.